Hey, hey everyone, it's your Peacekeeper, and it's time for the next video in our How to Play series on the French Cruiser Line. This is the Tier 2 Jurion de la Gravière. The Jurion de la Gravière was a single French protected cruiser built in at night. Uh, sorry, 1887 and launched in 1899. The ship was named after Edmond Jurien de la Gravière and his father, Pierre Roche Jurien de la Gravière, uh, both of them being French naval admirals during their respective adult careers. Jurien's protected cruiser design meant that machinery spaces were covered by a at-the-waterline turtleback, and we can see this actually in the armor viewer here. And this configuration put all of the machinery spaces and magazines below the water for one, but it also meant that any shells that came in and tried to hit uh, into those spaces would have to contend with this deck here. Now what separates this from what we would call a turtle back armor scheme is that there is no external belt armor on this. The outer hull plating is the same thickness all the way around. I mean, I, I guess technically Wargaming doesn't have it modeled that way, but 13 millimeters is hardly what I would call armor by any standard. And uh, Jurian is no exception there. The bulk of the armor on this ship is concentrated in the conning tower, but there are these Citadel armored deck slopes, which, uh, you know, are sloped just enough so that uh, Citadeling this cruiser is going to be very difficult. And even though Tier 2 cruisers see Tier 3 battleships, the only time you're really going to get citadeled in this ship is from longer ranges where the shell fire is coming in at a, a steep enough angle to actually penetrate this plate here. Otherwise, uh, you know, the thinner hull armor here at closer ranges, you're very likely to receive overpens. So it's actually kind of a unique defense feature. Uh, Julia also ha uh, has this and St. Louis on the U.S. side. And there are a couple other protected cruisers in the game as well outside of just those two. But those are the most obvious ones. Uh, Jurian's construction had several flaws that delayed the commissioning of the ship until 1903, but once commissioned, she served until 1921, when she was formally decommissioned and scrapped in 1922. At her launch, Jurian was assigned to the Far East, but during World War I, she was transferred to the Mediterranean, where she patrolled the Strait of Otranto. She spent her time repressing insurrections in Crete, bombarding Turkish positions in Turkey, and blockading Greece. In 1920, she was assigned to Syria before being replaced by a more modern ship. Then she was transferred home and then sold for scrap in 1922. In terms of in-game playstyle, uh, Jurian has uh, what I would consider the very standard affair for Tier 2 cruisers. I mean, there's nothing that's really stand out about this cruiser. I guess the speed might be one area, its armament might be one area, but it's not that the armament is particularly noteworthy. I mean, it doesn't exactly have the world's highest fire chance for a battery that is 165 millimeters. So we're just over six inches there in that six and a half um, range and six and a half inch range in terms of gun caliber. Only 9% fire chance, so not a huge amount there. Plus only 2300 damage for HE and 3100 if you get a Citadel for AP. Not exactly outstanding there, but you know, Jurian does have a, a reasonably good top speed of 24.2 knots. That's going to be with the speed flag. If we pull that off real quick, you'll see that it drops down to just 23. That's really not too bad for a tier 2 cruiser. 510 meter turning radius also isn't too bad, so it's fairly maneuverable. You also can see that it does have a fairly large number of guns on board at 8, and it can bring a total of 5 of them to bear but you have to expose a pretty healthy broadside to do it. So let's talk about some stats. Uh, in terms of hit points, 20,100 hit points, up to 160 millimeters of armor. Again, that's going to be in that conning tower there. The rest of the armor is going to be on those citadel slope decks there underneath the waterline. The main battery consists of 865 millimeter MLE 1893 guns. They have a 10.3 kilometer max range, 9 second reload time, a 104 meter dispersion, and we already kind of covered some of these other stats as well. Uh, 2300 HE shell damage and 3100 AP shell damage. Not exactly stellar, but it's a tier 2 cruiser. You're not going to be in it long enough for it to matter. 
It does have six 8mm guns for anti-aircraft defense, but let's be honest here, uh, we're not shooting anything down with those anytime soon, plus the chance of this thing seeing a carrier is slim to none. Max speed 23 knots, 510 meter turning circle radius, rudder shift time of 5.8 seconds. Detection range by sea of 8.7 kilometers, detection range by air of 5.4 kilometers. In terms of upgrades, if you do choose to do an upgrade on this ship, I mean, let's be honest here, it's a tier two, so you're not going to be in it super long. Probably not a huge reason to actually invest in this, but I would recommend main armaments mod one. This is just going to keep your main battery from being incapacitated. Uh, it's going to reduce the chance of it being incapacitated by 20%. It's going to increase their hit points by 50%, and it's going to decrease the time it takes to repair them by 20%. Now, the, the main battery on this, you can see it. They're basically highlighted in yellow there, with the exception of this one here. That's the conning tower, but they're highlighted there in yellow. They're not exactly huge targets on the ship, and the magazine spaces really aren't attached to them, so... Not a huge benefit here, which is why if you do decide to run one, it's not going to make a huge difference. I guess you could run Magazine Mod 1 if you're really worried about detonations, but personally, I wouldn't worry too much about it. All right, that's enough of me blabbing about this in port. Let's go look at it in a battle video. All right, so this battle is actually going to be a Tier 2, Tier 3 fight, and if I remember correctly, it is on islands and... Of course, Julian is, uh, you know, it, it's not a terrible ship by any stretch of the imagination. I, I mean, it's a tier two, so let's be honest here. We're not exactly expecting the world of it, but in terms of performance, I mean, it, it does all right. It, it's pretty good at hunting down cruisers er, and destroyers, mostly destroyers. And at this tier, there's enough destroyers. As you can see, there's four on the enemy team and four on ours. I mean, not that we're going to be hunting ours, but... Uh, there's four on the enemy team, and eh, we'll, we'll get it taken care of. And, you know, this this map, in terms of tactics, there's not really any tactics that really need to be known. Just some things as a takeaway from this. You're going to see just how bad the gun angles are. And we're going to, unfortunately, be stuck with some pretty rather lackluster gun angles for Tier 3 and Tier 4. And on top of that, we're not going to have a huge amount of armor either. So uh, a couple of the tactics to take away from this video are going to come down to uh, learning how to kite enemy ships, which if you're not sure what that means, basically you want them chasing you rather than you chasing them. It's significantly harder for them to hit you when they are chasing. And on top of that, you know, if you've got your speed flag on, even if you don't, you're faster than most ships at this tier, especially battleships. And those are really the big ones that you got to worry about. There are a couple of... Um, there are a couple of disadvantages to this ship. You know, like, like I said, you know, it does have pretty lackluster armor. You've got no armor belt to really speak of. Sure, you don't get Citadel real easy, but you do accept damage from just about every source. So that means you got to kind of play the ship a little conservative in order to actually get... Uh, in order to actually get the most out of it. Now, we got ourselves a Dirtsky squad. We're, we're going to call it a full squad. Uh, so here you can see kind of the gun angles. We're, we're basically broadside, but uh, gun angles, in order to bring five guns to bear, it requires a, a healthy amount of broadside to be shown. And we're turning away from the dirt skis because the dirt skis are, uh, well, they do have torpedoes. They're very short-ranged, but we do, don't want to just go running headlong into them. Don't know why I decided to shoot that. Maybe it was in frustration. I don't know. Ooh, one of them got hit by a torpedo. We are going to continue to go this way, even though it exposes us and puts us by our lonesome. And the reason for that is simple. Well, we need to get rid of these dirt skis. We do have this Weymouth coming in. I'm not really all that worried about the Weymouth at this point. I'm more worried about having both these dirt skis decide to get super aggressive and push. Plus, we've got a whole bunch of ships coming our way. I, I really don't think it'll be too much of an issue. Here you can see we are turning back around to try and engage. Okay, so we're detected. That means one of these ships is out. Yep, you can see him there. Ooh, he, that's definitely that torpedo that he took. Wearing his uh, ocean soul camo. 
think we got some dedicated seal clubbers down here. At least I have the excuse that I'm down here to help you guys out. <laughs> I don't know what these guys are doing. Uh, I don't know why I didn't shoot there. Okay. So we're going to turn back around here. And this is one of the few times I wish I had hydro, but eh, we don't. I don't know what these guys are actually doing or what they're intending to accomplish. It, it seems odd to me. Okay, so another dirt ski is out of the smoke. We're going to go ahead and gauge him. You can see at this angle we can only bring three guns to bear. At least they are pretty accurate, but it does require you to be exposing significantly more of the side of your ship to actually bring all of the guns to bear. Okay, we can also see... Uh, the other dirt ski has finally decided to move from where he was at, but this this position really puts them at a disadvantage. I, I honestly don't know what it exactly was that they were planning on doing here. I don't know if they were just planning to catch this Bellerophon just completely off guard or what, but I don't know. Who knows? Who cares? We're going to do our best to... Oh, and down goes a dirt ski. So you can see there... Did a pretty good amount of damage there, and this is those torpedoes that I was talking about. Short range, but a lot of them and very fast moving. Um, we got the one down, pretty good chunk of his hit point pool taken off. You can see we're only getting, you know, about one hit on him, averaging about 800 damage. Not too shabby for this tier, however, the 800 damage is... Uh, it seems to be hit or miss. I don't know if you just noticed that, but I had a 300 damage salvo there and then promptly followed it up with another single shell impact that did 759 damage. Like, what? That doesn't make really any sense. So now we're going to switch our attention to the Weymouth. In truth, tactically, probably should be heading north at this point because the enemy has two caps to R1. Well, it's a decision that it's going to come back to haunt us later. Also, this Tenryu, I don't know exactly what he was planning on accomplishing, but he is awfully close to that Weymouth, and poor Tenryu, you're not going to survive that engagement without significant levels of player skill, and if you're going broadside to him, I'm... yeah. Tenryu has a very soft citadel. It's one of the few cruisers at this tier that... Uh, sorry, at tier 3 that is significantly easy to remove away remove from the game if one presents its broadside to you and you have ap loaded you aim in the midsection so that the shells aim at hit the, at the midsection and you're going to rack up massive amounts of citadel hits so we are finally headed north and by this time the battle you know we're fairly even but we've we've traded destroyers for cruisers and at this tier i would much rather have the the cruisers than the destroyers simply because uh, cruiser gameplay at this tier is a little bit uh, a little bit more robust and a little bit more consistent shot some AP at him here you can see not really doing a whole lot in the way of damage but definitely want to keep our wiggling and waggling going here let loose another salvo on him probably not going to get any citadels at this range. If we do, I would be shocked. Overpen for 310 damage. We turn in slightly there just to try and help, you know, mitigate some of the damage that we're going to be taking. You're going to be seeing this Dresden is just doing a lot of... Uh, I mean, it's consistent damage. I don't want to say it's a lot, a lot, but it is consistent. And oop, there's 1,300 damage taken off of the Weymouth. He eats a torpedo. That would be one of Land Warrior's torpedoes. And now we've got another salvo out on him. That was a much better salvo. It would have been nice if it was aimed just a little bit lower so that it actually impacted at the water line. Probably would have killed him off at that point. And, well, we're going to get the kill, but it was only because he only had 327 hit points left. It was either the Koenig Albert or the Bellerophon that actually managed to damage him sufficiently to, to cause that to happen. So now we got a Strozovoy going up against Land Warrior and Izumakaze, so we need to help him out. We've switched back to HE, trying to slow down to help, trying to pre-lead, and, yep, at this tier, uh, probably need to spend a little bit more time at this tier if I want to do those kinds of crazy things. Another shot out on the Strozovoy. 1,300 hit points. Somebody just needs to poke him, and down he'll go, and Land Warrior manages to finish him off. 
Now we have the Nassau coming in, and unfortunately, this is probably going to claim Land Warrior, because he sailed out of his smoke for some reason. So we're going to try our best to do some damage to him. Up to 15,000 damage. We got three kills already. Granted, you know, probably a little bit in the, the kill stealing range here. So trying to hover between cover by the island, our, our concealment, got ourselves some hard cover, but not enough that uh, it's impacting, you know, what shells can hit. We're running into a little bit of a problem back there with the Dresden. And the Dresden is like a machine gun. It just continuously spews out fire and pain and suffering. And, well, he does a plenty good job of doing exactly that. Now, if I were him, I probably wouldn't have stopped here because, well, I mean, he, he got his freebie salvo there when the, the Koenig Albert missed, but now he's got to contend with a lot of ships firing at him. Especially since he slowed down, and at this tier, ships don't accelerate very well unless you're a Royal Navy ship. So overall playstyle so far, you guys have seen me be pretty aggressive and punish some destroyers. Now we're going to see the kiting come into play. You can see here I've turned myself so that I'm angled away. Ooh, there's a good fire. Uh, we've angled myself away so that uh, any incoming fire I've got the opportunity to dodge. And going to shoot at this Dresden as he hides behind this island here because we're one of the few ships that can actually hit him. And we do. We managed to land a hit of normal pen for 380 damage. Uh, the, hip, the hit ribbons do some weird things at this tier. That fire burning. You know, we've gotten two fire started this match. I would consider this to be a pretty good match for RNG giving us fires. And, you know, until we get to this latter part and then I'm kind of wondering what the heck happened. One normal pen, you know, these are hitting turrets, so we're, we're getting a lot of shatters. And this is a point at which I wish I was in that Tenryu so I could... Oop, there's another fire. Wish I was in the Tenryu so that I could have uh, torpedoes. <laughs> or in a destroyer. A destroyer would be beneficial as well. Okay, so the Nassau has repaired his... Oop, now he's shooting at us. He has repaired his fires that means any fires that we start after this are going to result in pretty good damage numbers to him he burned for quite a while there too maybe he didn't burn it i don't know you can see him alternating between you know angled and not and he's just lopping off you know a thousand hit points at a time that time i had enough angle on him that uh, we were able to go ahead and dodge the salvo entirely. Now he is currently only able to bring to bear his front three guns and he's gonna have to wiggle a little bit to use them. And this should give us actually, I would consider this favorable dodging. I mean, look at this, we, we've managed to mitigate his ability to do damage entirely, except for at that moment. <laughs> Insert foot into mouth. And here, trying to start that fire and just not really ending up being too terribly lucky with it. Okay, so Nassau is still coming around. 1,500 damage. We are finally starting to do some damage here. I mean, it, it, it's slow but steady here. That one hit the water line. That doesn't really help out at any. And in this case, you know, the we've, we've kind of come to a head here where, unfortunately, we are not going to be doing... A whole lot in terms of uh, winning this battle. I think the the battle has shifted to the point where we probably are not going to succeed. Yeah, especially since, uh, well, he can do that. You know, Nassau's gun configuration would have never been this useful in real life. In fact, there's a reason why it went away. Finally, another fire. We're up to 33,000 damage. Can we get more? Trying to turn away here. There's two more, so now he's on fire three times. <laughs> Come on, RNG, save me. Yep. So we have managed to successfully... Dang it, we're on fire. Got to repair that right away. I I have a... We can get this. I know we can get this. 17... Oh! He manages to repair, and there comes in the salvo from there. Uh, that was their South Carolina that managed to get me. So up... 40,534 damage, you know, for tier 2, that's not doing too bad. Six fires, that's alright. 85 shells launched and hit. Overall, you know, 
I'm glad that this ship is a short grind and that it doesn't require a whole lot of uh, time spent on it because, quite honestly, there are more exciting ships in this line than, than the Tier 2, obviously. Otherwise, you wouldn't be grinding it, nor would it be a how-to-play video series. <coughs> Aircraft carriers. Um, anyway, so... Overall, you know, the, the big tactic learned here was, was kiting, and that was the one that I really wanted to show the most. And the, the reason for that was simple. Uh, basically, kiting is one of the strong suits that we're going to see come up in other French cruisers. In fact, the vast majority of the French cruisers have enough speed and stealth to be able to kite successfully and... Once they get to a point where they can no longer do it successfully without it being too risky, they can basically just disappear off the map because they have relatively good stealth. And it's not like carriers are going to be able to do a whole lot to them either because they've got pretty decent AA once you get into the high tier stuff. You know, starting with Emile Bertin, we start getting into the, the 40 millimeter Bofors with in like non trivial amounts. Like we actually get them in decent amounts. And the AA starts being quite ferocious. And then La Sonnier at tier six just kind of ramps it up even further. Okay, so the end of the battle there, you know, we're third on the team, 556 base XP, but we got three kills and 505,000 potential damage. Overall, not a bad ship. Definitely um, a quick grind through, though, if you absolutely hate it. Anyway, I'm your peacekeeper. Like, comment, subscribe, and thank you for watching.